we've seen previously, particle physics, and particularly the standard model, has quite a few conservation laws. And every time there's a conservation law, that means there's a symmetry. Now, in the standard model, typically we represent those symmetries as groups. And so, to start with, we're going to have a, a quick refresh, or if you've never seen it before, uh, a quick coverage of what is meant by a group in mathematics. Now, we don't need to know a lot of details about groups, just the basic properties of groups and how those groups can be used to represent a symmetry. So, in mathematics, a group is essentially a list of uh, elements, or members if it's a group, um, and so on. And, and these are then um, you know, operated on by some operator. So the group is the list of elements plus the operator. And this is a binary operator. And for this list of elements and this operator to be a group, there have to be four conditions that are satisfied. The first of these is that it has to be a closed group. So A operated on B has to, if A and B are members of the group, then A operated on B also has to be a member of the group as well. And so it has to be closed. The next property is that it has to be associative. So if I, um, for example, take an element, a member of the group A, and a member of the group B, a member of the group C, and then I do A operated on and then B operated on C, that has to be equal to A operated on B, then operated on C. And so it has to be associative. And so that's the second requirement on groups. The next requirement is <clears throat> there has to be an identity. So that means there has to be a member of the group A, um, that when it's operated on with the identity, which is another member of the group, I always get A. And this has to be true for any member of the group, right? So if I put B here, operated on with I, I have to get B. So there has to be an identity, right? A member of the group that acts as an identity under the operation. And then lastly, there has to be an inverse. And what that means is that if I've got an element A, and I have another member of the group that I'm going to call the inverse of A, then when I operate A and the inverse of A together, I get back the identity element. So that's the sort of, these are the requirements. If these four requirements are not met, then you do not have a group. So if we take as an example all the integers, so I'm now going to, you know, if we take all the integers, so minus infinity all the way through zero, all the way up to plus infinity, but only the integers, and we consider addition, then we can see that all of these rules are true. If I take any two integers and I add them together, then I end up with another uh, integer. Right, uh, so 3 plus minus 7 is minus 4, and that is another member of the group, and that's always going to be true. It's clearly associative. You know, 1 plus 2 plus 3, it doesn't matter whether I add the 2 and the 3 together and then add the 1, or whether I add the 1 and the 2 together and then add the 3. It gives me the same answer both ways. So we've got closed, we've got associative. Now for the identity, well, let's take the element 4, and I need to add it to something to get back 4. Well, that's easy to see that I just add 0, right? So 0 is the identity uh, for the positive integers under addition. So we have an identity, and of course we have an inverse, because if I take 4 and I add to it the uh, minus 4, then, of course, I get the identity. And so every positive integer's inverse is just the same integer with a minus sign in front of it. Um, and so there's always an inverse for every element. So all four conditions are satisfied, so the integers under addition form a group. Now, there is one other optional property uh, for groups, and that's called uh, whether or not they're abelian. That this does not have to be true. You can have a group even if this isn't true. But if A operated on B is equal to B operated on A, then the group is said to be abelian. But this is optional. It is not a requirement to be a group. Some groups are abelian. Other groups are not abelian.
And if you're having trouble remembering this, well, the acronym uh, to remember is CANE. So closed, associative, uh, identity, and an inverse. And then, of course, you combine that with the optional property, uh, which is ABLE. So you've got CANE and ABLE. So <clears throat> that's the definition, a quick recap of the definition of a mathematical group. It's a collection of elements and an operator. Now, in particle physics, there's a particular uh, types of groups that are, are useful when we're describing the standard model. Um, but before we get to those, I need to refresh your memory, hopefully refresh your memory on what a unitary matrix is. So a unitary matrix is one that includes uh, complex numbers. So the elements of the matrix can be uh, complex numbers. And if you take the uh, complex conjugate, so U star, and then you transpose it uh, here, then, uh, and that can be written as U dagger, so complex conjugate transpose is often written with this uh, dagger symbol here, that is equal to the inverse of the matrix, right? And remember, the inverse is defined such that U, uh, U to the minus one gives you the identity uh, matrix. So with that definition in mind, um, there are different uh, classes of uh, groups that are particularly useful. So, for example, we can consider U1, and this is the group of one by one unitary um, matrices. And so, this is a, a group, um, and it's called U1. Obviously, there's things like U2, U3, and U4, um, but this group. Um, contains a uh, represents a symmetry that we will see later on in the standard model so i'm just introducing the concept here we'll see it later on and this one is in fact associated with electromagnetism another symmetry that's particularly useful for the standard model is called su2 and the s here stands for special so it's the special unitary group of two by two matrices. And the special means that the determinant has to be equal to one. So these are now uh, two by two matrices uh, with determinant one that are also unitary. And this turns out to be useful to represent a symmetry of the weak interactions. And then the last one we're going to see is SU3, which again, special, so that means determinant one, uh, unitary, so complex conjugate transpose is the inverse. And then this is now uh, three by three matrices. And this is the, this group here represents the symmetry of the strong force. So these uh, groups of unitary matrices um, represent, uh, can be used to represent the symmetries in the standard model, but they are essentially mathematical groups. And uh, to give you an idea of sort of what these sort of mathematical, how these mathematical groups can represent a symmetry, well, you know, you can also have SO2. Now, O here are orthogonal matrices. And so an orthogonal matrix is like a unitary matrix, but it only contains real numbers. And so there, of course, you don't need the, uh, the, the complex conjugate. So if I take um, an orthogonal matrix and I transpose it, then that gives me the inverse of that orthogonal matrix. And so these are two by two matrices, and essentially these represent uh, 2D rotations. So if you had... Um, some physics that is invariant under 2D rotation. So in other words, you can do a two-dimensional rotation in a plane and all the laws of physics remain the same, which in fact applies. In, in our case, you can certainly rotate in about a single axis and the laws of physics are invariant under that. Of course, I'll because we live in a three-dimensional world, our, our rotation is, is not SO2 because we've actually got 3D rotations. Um, <clears throat> but this SO2 group, if you've got some system that never changes under 2D rotation, then it has a symmetry of called SO2. So it's always the same under any 2D rotation. And so that's the same thing uh, that we mean when we're talking about these SU, uh, U1, SU2, SU3, right? If we do a, uh, an operation under SU3, then the physics remains the same. It does not change right? And so that's how a group 
can represent a symmetry. So now we've seen uh, got a basic understanding of what is meant in mathematics by a group and we've seen at least a sort of simple example of how a group can be related to a symmetry. Now the next piece of the puzzle is how is a symmetry related to a conservation law? And to understand that we have to go back to Lagrangian mechanics and see how a symmetry of the Lagrangian can be related to a conservation law through Noether's theorem that was discovered in 1917 by the German mathematician Emmy Noether and at least in my opinion is one of the most beautiful bits of mathematics. So let's have a quick refresher of what Lagrangian mechanics are and how that applies to Noether's theorem. Now Lagrangian mechanics is something that you should already be familiar with and basically uh, what we do in Lagrangian mechanics is we represent a system by a, a function that we call the Lagrangian and this is a function of some position coordinates qi, some essentially velocity coordinates or the rate of change of position with respect to time qi dot and potentially time as well. And the equations of motion, we can get the equations of motion using the uh, Euler-Lagrange uh, relationship uh, shown here, where uh, we take the rate of change uh, with respect to time of the partial derivative of L with respect to qi dot, and that is equal to um, the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the coordinate uh, q, um, and there should be an i there. So if I have a Lagrangian that is independent of qi, then that is where Noether's theorem comes in. And this is the most beautiful bit of mathematics. Because if my Lagrangian is independent of qi, this means that partial L by partial qi will equal zero. Um, because there's no explicit dependence of the Lagrangian function on this coordinate qi. And when that happens, it means that the rate of change of this quantity uh, with respect to time is zero. And so therefore, we end up with a conservation law that partial L by partial qi dot is equal to a constant, because its rate uh, it's d by dt is equal to zero, so this must be a constant uh, with time. It cannot change. And that is basically what Noether's theorem says, is that if you've got a, uh, if the Lagrangian is independent of uh, one of the coordinates, then, um, or is independent of, of one of the variables, that independence, that symmetry, um, produces a conservation law. And so this is a fundamental link Every time you have a symmetry of your Lagrangian, you have to have a conservation law associated with it, some quantity that's constant. And it's easy to see how this works. If we take, for example, the classical free particle Lagrangian, then this is just the uh, sum from i equals 1 to, to 3 of a half m you know, x i. Uh, squared, right? So this is just the sum of the kinetic energies in the x, y, and uh, z direction. Now, <clears throat> since I've got no dependence on x, i here, I can take any x, i, so let's just take uh, uh, you know, x, uh, uh, x, 1, and so what I get is, you know, partial L by uh, partial x1 is equal to zero because there's no explicit dependence on x1 in the Lagrangian. And what that tells me is that partial L by partial x1 uh, dot is equal to a constant. Well, what that tells me is if I take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to um, the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x1 dot, well, that of course just gives me m x1. And that, of course, is just the you know uh, x component of the momentum. And so the fact that the Lagrangian is independent under translation, it has no dependence on any of the coordinates x, y, or z, immediately uh, produces the conservation of momentum. And so 
that's uh, a fundamental link between a symmetry and a conservation law. So now we've got a basic understanding of what a group is in mathematics and how a group can relate to a symmetry and how symmetries give us conservation laws. Now, we did briefly mention some of the sort of the more fundamental symmetries in the standard model related to the interactions, the electromagnetic, the weak and the strong. However, one of the first symmetries found in what eventually became the standard model was related to flavor. And that symmetry was actually similar to the symmetry that you get from spin half particles. So in the next video, we're going to have a quick refresher of quantized angular momentum, and then we'll see how that can be related to a flavor symmetry called isospin of the standard model. Yeah.